We are live. Good evening and welcome to the meeting of the exam school admissions task force. <clears throat> because this is a remote session, I will ask Ms. Parvex to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Conopasis. Mr. Acevedo, Ms. Aguirre, Mr. Charno, Mr. Mr. Kreger, Present. Dr. Freeman Wisdom, Present. Ms. Grassa, Present. Ms. Lam, Present. Ms. Nagasawa, Present. Ms. Garrett, Present. Dr. Tang, Present. Ms. Waite, Present. Ms. Sullivan, and Mr. Contempasis. Present. Thank you. We are pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdean, Portuguese, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Arabic, and Somali. After I finish introducing the interpreters, we will activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference. Our Spanish interpreter this evening is Juan Bernal. Will you please invite our Spanish speaking audience to switch their Zoom channel in Spanish? Certainly, Mr. Contempasas. Good evening, everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I am the simultaneous Spanish interpreter assigned for this meeting to interpret everything simultaneously. I will now proceed to explain how to access the interpretation feature in Spanish. Buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy el intérprete asignado para español para la interpretación simultánea para aquellas personas que quieran accesar el servicio de la interpretación tienen que buscar el globo circular que aparece en la, bajo, en la parte baja de la pantalla. Tienen que seleccionar el idioma español para poder escuchar mi interpretación simultánea. <coughs> aquellas personas que se estén conectando de un teléfono celular en la parte superior de la pantalla van a ver tres puntos. Seleccionan el punto de la interpretación y seleccionan español para escuchar mi interpretación. Muchas gracias y buenas noches. Thank you very much, Mr. Contemporary. Thank you. Stay proceed. Thank you. A Cabo Verdean interpreter is Josiane Lopes. Will you please give the Zoom instructions in Cabo Verdean? Thank you, Mr. Contemporary. Good evening, everyone. Boa tarde. Meu nome é Josiane. Estou bem certo que os intérpretes para que eram new ali. Para ter acesso à interpretação simultânea, eu clico na icona de globo na parte inferior do meu ecrã e clico em Cabo Verdean. Se você está usando o telemóvel, clique no três pontinhos na parte superior. Se você tem alguma pergunta, coloque no chat. Obrigada. Thank you. Thank you. A Portuguese interpreter is Christian Leitner. Will you please give Zoom instructions in Portuguese? Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Meu nome é Cristiane. Eu sou intérprete de português brasileiro. Se você precisa de interpretação para essa reunião, Assim que eles acionarem os canais, você vai achar um globo na parte inferior da tela, você clica ali e escolhe o canal português. Se você estiver usando um celular, você vai ver na parte superior direita, três pontos, você clica ali e escolhe o canal português brasileiro. Se você tiver alguma pergunta ou dúvida, você pode colocar em português no chat. Obrigada. Thank you. A Vietnamese interpreter is V. Lee. Will you please give the Zoom instructions in Vietnamese? Good evening, everyone. My name is V. I will be your Vietnamese interpreter for this meeting. Kính chào quý vị. Tôi tên là V. Tôi sẽ là thông dịch viên của quý vị ngày hôm nay. Xin quý vị nhìn vào màn hình và tìm quả cầu vào bấm vào tiếng Việt để có thể nghe được thông dịch viên nói chuyện. Cảm ơn rất nhiều. Thank you. Thank you. Our Cantonese interpreter is Terry Yin. Please give the Zoom instructions in Cantonese. Thank you, Mr. Contempasis. Uh, Thank you. Our Mandarin interpreter is Wei Li. Please give the Zoom instructions in Mandarin. Thank you, sir. 
。哎，大家好，我是你的普通话翻译啊，我叫伟啊。如果你需要普通话翻译的话呢，请你点击屏幕下方的地球仪，然后选择这个中文啊，中文频道，然后就可以听我这个翻译啊。如果你是用手机或者是平板的话呢，啊，请你点这个三个点，啊、然后也可以听我这个翻译。好，祝大家好运。OK， back to you, sir. Thank you. Our Haitian Creole interpreter is Sergio Saint Hilaire. Please give the Zoom instructions in Haitian Creole. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergio Saint Hilaire, Haitian Creole interpreter. Uh, nous comptons aujourd'hui à encore pour nous avoir pour nous participer dans réunion ça avoir aujourd'hui hein et que c'est un plaisir pour nous pour nous traduire tout ça que vous dit tout ça qu'a dit pour nous faire comprendre. Si vous besoin entrer dans conversation, vous supposez cliquer là en bas quand là ou après une globe ou cliquer ou cap entrer là dedans et pour participer et nous même n'a traduit tout ça que vous besoin dit pour nous dire bonne écoute merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you. A Somali interpreter is Camilla Jamal. Please give the Zoom instructions in Somali. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Magai wa kutun Camilla kusoda wa da awa and galapta shirkena o int ayanta no soude marko hadi gari kaptin global ka Somali ga haka suiga degrees ta atkiga marko soda wa da. Thank you. Thank you. Our Arabic interpreter is Ahmad Ahmed Al Rubaye. Please give the Zoom instructions in Arabic. Thank you, sir. Marhaba, ana ismi Ahmed Rubai, ana muterjim al-gal Arabiya li hada al-yom. Bi imkanakum al-dhahab ila asfal al-shasha, sitashahidun alamat al-kwa al-ardiya. Udgut ala hadhi al-alama wa sitatar laka akhtiyarat al-lugat. Kum bakhtiyar al-lugat al-arabiya wa anda sitamakka min istima ila al-tarjama al-fawriya bil-lugat al-arabiya. Shukran jazeera. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We regret that we were unable to secure American Sign Language interpreters for today's session. We will now activate the closed caption feature and the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. And I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. We will now move on to the approval of the corrected minutes from the June 24th, 2021 meeting. Before I entertain a motion to approve the minutes, I believe there is further correction to be made and I will call on Mr. Krager. Thank you, Mr. Compton Paxis. In the meeting minutes for June 24th at the very end, I would like to change uh, the language at the bottom of page four and top of page five so that the final sentence in the paragraph about racial balance, so that it reads, for him, that meant an effort to, and here's the change, eliminate barriers to equal educational opportunity so that exam school students experience the educational benefits of diversity. Ms. Parvex, do you have all that? Yes, thank you, I do. Thank you. With that correction, I would now entertain a motion to accept the minutes of the June 24th, 2021 meeting. May I, I have so a move. motion, please? I so move. Is there a second? I second. second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion as corrected? Hearing none, Ms. Parvex, will you please call the roll? Thank you. Mr. Acevedo? Aye. Ms. Aguirre? Mr. Trano? Mr. Craiger? Aye. Dr. Freeman Wisdom? Aye. Ms. Grassa? Aye. Ms. Lum? Aye. Ms. Nagasawa? Aye. Ms. Garrett? Aye. Dr. Tang? Aye. Ms. Waite? Aye. Ms. Sullivan? Aye. And Mr. Quantum Passes? Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd like to now turn the meeting over to uh, Ms. Hogan. But prior to that, I would ask Ms. Sullivan, do you have anything to uh, say regarding the opening of the session? No, not at this time. I just want to thank everyone. No, not at this time, but 
<laughs> truly. I just want to thank everyone in advance um, for your time tonight. I know that we have, um, you know, a couple of hours allocated, but I suspect we might we might push it a little bit longer. So I do want to just thank everyone, task force members and interpreters specifically um, for um, hanging in there tonight um, so that we can get this done. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Ms. Uh, Hogan, would you begin your uh, presentation, please? Thank you, Mr. Captain Passes. Pulling up the right screen. Okay. Um, so as I normally do um, when, when looking at simulations, I want to remind you of the assumptions underlying those simulations. Um, simulation is assuming a thousand invitations to distribute um, where students attending a sixth grade school with 50% or more of economically disadvantaged students uh, receiving an additional 10% of total possible points on their overall score. Um, the data set underlying this is the same group. Um, so it's the seventh grade applicants for school year 2021. Um, those are the, the students who have just finished their seventh grade year. Um, we incorporate the IC scores in place of map growth because that is the data that is available and the GPA is calculated using the fall grades only. Um, as a reminder, um, we don't incorporate school preference in the simulations. Um, we don't incorporate any eligibility criteria, meaning if students had a GPA and test score, they're considered eligible. Um, the economically disadvantaged data by school is from DESE, um, and DESE only reports that data for public schools, which includes charter and BPS schools. Um, and then you'll notice that we've simplified some of the tables to only reflect one tier option, um, but we'll make the other two tier options available in the appendix for you. Um, so we're, we're showing tier option five, that option is the one that replaces median income with the percentage of people in poverty. Um, all of the tier options include a variable related to English language. Um, also just wanna provide a reminder um, that these simulations only provide a sense of what may happen um, and shouldn't be interpreted as definitive results for a couple of reasons. Um, the proposal right now um, is to include science and social studies grades, which we don't have available for the simulations. Um, as you know, our, our current district assessment contract is with NWEA for math growth. Um, this simulation uses IC scores because we don't have math growth results um, for an entire applicant pool. Um, Applicants for the next admission cycle may not be distributed across the city in the same way. Um, so just keep that in mind, um, as well as the grades being proposed to be used with the school year 21-22 grades have not yet been recorded, um, which is different from how we ran the simulations last time where we did have actual grades available to be used. Uh, so just a reminder of, of what what this data can tell us. Um, and then before we move into the simulations requested last week, we wanted to provide a quick correction. Um, while we did um, use IC and GPA at 50% each in the previous simulations, um, there was the IC test scores were incorrectly scaled um, which resulted in less differentiation between scores. So we have corrected that, um, and I will show you the impact of that um, in a second in the next slides. Um, as a quick explanation for what that means, 
Um, in the IC, there are, are four sections, reading, math, quantitative, and verbal. Um, each section has a scaled score from 760 to 940, um, which a total possible score then, if you scored 940 on all four sections, would be 3,760. Um, so that number was incorrectly used to determine the proportion of points earned, um, should have used 720 um, because each of the four sections has 180 possible points. This primarily benefited students with lower test scores. Um, and you'll see that the impact is primarily in the 20% of invitations. Um, so this slide shows you um, the comparison by economic status. Um, and so what you'll see, the tables on the top are the original tables shared last week. And in the bottom are the updated tables. Um, and so in this instance, you see less economically disadvantaged students receiving an invitation in the 20%, um, which has effects on the overall um, invitations where um, you see slightly less proportion on this 55% of the 20 and 80% together compared to this 51%. And as always, if you have questions, please raise your hand. I'm gonna move on to the comparison by zip code. Um, again, the impact is mainly in the 20%. Um, and so it highlighted um, where the change was two or more percentage points in either direction. Ms. Lum? Ms. Hogan, thank you for all of this and for doing so much work over a short period of time. Um, can you remind me again of the difference between the 20 plus 80 tier option versus the 100% tier option? Yep, so the, the 20 plus 80, <clears throat> are you talking about this set of columns compared to this set of columns? Yes, and also how that second set of columns, how that differs from just doing 100% by tier. Yep, um, so this set of columns separates the 20% from the 80%. So you can see the seed allocation in both um, sections. Um, and these columns combine them together. So you see the overall um, percentage. I, was not able to fit the 100% on this slide, but it is um, in the appendix. Um, Thank you. And we'll see that in um, some of the results from the requested simulations from last week. Um, I just wanna share one more slide with the correction. Um, again, difference is primarily in the 20% by race.
again, Ms. Hogan, just to um, ask, be the one to ask a silly question. The major distinction, what, what was updated between the original and the updated? Yep, so we adjusted the way that the IC score was incorporated um, because we essentially used the wrong denominator to determine the percentage of points that a student had earned. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna move into the 12 simulations that were asked for last week. Um, so this table across the top um, just outlines the three mechanisms that were requested. Um, so that's the 20% citywide rank and the 80% tiers rank, then the 100% tiers rank, and then the 20% citywide rank, 40% tiers rank, 40% tiers lottery. Um, we were not able to simulate a 40% tiers qualified lottery because we did not have a cutoff composite score to determine students eligible for a lottery. Um, so when you see the simulation results for that last mechanism, um, it's gonna display data only for the 20% city rank and then the 40% tiers rank. The rows you see down the left over here, um, display the different proportions of GPA and assessment that were requested in the composite score. So 50-50, 60% GPA, 40% assessment, 70% GPA, 30% assessment, 80% GPA, 20% assessment. Um, and all four options have that high poverty school indicator that we talked about. Okay, so tried to simplify the number of columns for you to look at today. Um, so the, the top table just shows you the actual invitees from the 2021 um, year and then the outcome for the 21-22 invitees, which is the interim policy. Across the bottom, you'll see the top row here shows you 50% assessment, 50% GPA, then 40%, 60, 30, 70, 20, 80. Um, and then this next row underneath those refer to the mechanism. So 2080, the 20 citywide, 80 tiers rank, 100 is the full tiers rank. And this 2040 is that first portion, the 20 citywide rank, 40 tiers rank. Ms. Garrett. Um, just trying to get a summary statement from the data. Is it correct, Ms. Hogan, that there is not an advantage for economically disadvantaged students to use the split with 40% and 40% lottery? It's hard to say because um, we don't know the outcome of that 40% lottery. Um, so the first 20 citywide rank and then the 40 tiers rank, um, we see lower percentages of um, 
economically disadvantaged students in those two parts, suggesting that the um, when you compare it to the 2080, for example, more economically disadvantaged students um, are likely getting in later down in the ranking, if that makes sense. So the takeaway, and this is actually an important point, where you see 2040, it's important to know that the data only reflects 60% of the seats. It does not reflect 40% of the seats. Okay. So the where it says 2040, the team was unable to provide a complete simulation inclusive of the 40% of seats that would be allocated by a qualified lottery. So you have to take that into consideration as you're looking at any of the 2040 splits. Okay. All right. I see heads nodding. So folks got that. All right. Good. Thank you. Be ready for the next. Thank you. Yes. Um, this one's a lot of columns again, but it is the zip code data. Um, you'll see it's laid out in the same way with the same columns. Um, and can you remind us tier option five is what median household income? Tier option five is percentage of people in poverty. Percentage of people in poverty, okay, thank you. Thank you. And so this slide is by race, uh, same format. Ms. Grasso. <clears throat> I just wanna make sure I'm reading this correctly. So it appears that if we just look at 2080 and 100 across each of these four options, there's not a significant difference in terms of um, students who are offered acceptance by race. Is that an accurate way to say that? I would, I would agree with that. I think the biggest difference you see is three percentage points for any one group, mm -hmm. which I see here for white students and here for Latinx students. But everything else is 
one or two percentage points. Thank you. And I believe just this, this is a, a repeat of the slide from the beginning, just reminders of um, limitations of the simulations that um, we shouldn't expect these numbers to be definitive results, um, given the, the number of factors um, that may change. Is this your last slide? Yes. Could you go back to um, socioeconomic, please? Great, thank you. Okay. All right, great. Um, so Based on this data, I would, I mean, there, the most significant impact when we look, I mean, as I'm looking at this, as we look at the, um, the different options in terms of weighting, um, the most significant impact from a weighting standpoint seems to come with respect to socioeconomic diversity. Um, as was pointed out, there's very little impact from a racial and ethnic standpoint. And there's also very little impact from a geographic standpoint, but we do see an uptick um, and increased closer to balance socioeconomic um, in looking at the 70-80 split I mean, the 70-30 split, 70-80, 70-30 split, and in the 80-20 split. And so I would suggest that we sit there for a moment um, and try to think through, would love to just get a reaction to that. Uh, Ms. Garrett. Yes, I noticed that as well. Um, however, I think that um, we should also think about that the more weight that's placed on grades, um, the more potential for subjectivity if they are dramatically more weighted than another factor, um, especially considering that none of the grades for the coming year have been submitted as yet. Um, and looking at the weighting of some of the grades and specific zip codes, um, it looks as if there's some level of unpredictability that we might have um, if we overweight or disproportionately weight grades that I'm a little concerned about and conscious of. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I, I agree with Ms. Garrett. Plus one. Ms. Lum? Would the use of additional scores like social studies, science, um, have any balancing effect to the uh, potential inflation in the ELA and math scores? I would say, I think it could go either way. <laughs> um, I think for some kids, adding those two additional scores will help them immensely. And I think for some, it won't be as helpful. The other piece I, I do want to, I, I just want to put this into the space because um, I know that there are a lot of educators, classroom educators who um, watch our meetings, whether it's like live or they go back and review them. I know we've talked a lot about grade inflation and I just want to put into the space just for the record that the over what I believe that the overwhelming majority of classroom educators grade with integrity. 
Okay. And I know that we, we, we're, we're talking the extremes relative to great inflation. I just want to be clear that, you know, I, I do believe that the vast majority of classroom educators have integrity when they are assessing our students. Um, with an understanding that it is important for us to be mindful of, again, what the data tells us about um, what is happening in some, in a subset of, of schools. That was editorializing, but I, I just want to say that for our, for our educators. Dr. Tung, Mr. Kreger. Um, so these simulations use the ISEE. Um, and I feel like map growth or MCAS with, uh, could give very different simulations. So I'm wondering, Ms. Hogan, do you have a prediction as to how these tables would shift if we use the, the two tests under discussion? Is there a generalization you could hazard to guess upon? Um, I don't, I don't want to generalize in terms of what the simulation results um, might give us, but part of what the RFP committee was looking for in selecting a new assessment um, was something that would be aligned to the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks, um, knowing that the ISCE was not um, necessarily, necessarily aligned to what was being taught in BPS schools. Um, I believe there's been a research study around MCAS. Um, I, I don't know the results um, off the top of my head, um, but I would, I would hypothesize that they might look slightly different, um, but I don't wanna, don't wanna suppose anything um, without a, a larger fact base in front of me. Thank you, Mr. Krager. Thank you, and thank you, Ms. Hogan and your team for uh, putting this together for us over the weekend. Would it be possible to share the slides for tonight with us, perhaps via Ms. Parvex while we're meeting, so that we can yeah, that's a good idea. close right now as we talk and, and... That's yeah, good. we'll coordinate to get those sent out shortly. Thank, thank you, you. Mr. Acevedo. Well, first, I, I, I would, um, I was thinking perhaps uh, precisely what Dr. Tung had shared, and I agree with her. Um, the, we shouldn't be surprised if, um, if the, I, I, in fact, I, I could almost, I'd be, a, I'd, I would be surprised if um, the, our students wouldn't, didn't perform better if the simulation included the map growth or um, the MCATs. Uh, with respect to um, Ms. Garrett's uh, comment about um, grade uh, subjectivity, um, uh, Ms. Sullivan, I, I don't, and again, and again, I'm here kind of sort of like cross editorializing. I don't, I don't disagree um, that our teachers, most of them, grade with integrity, or that all teachers, you know, grade with integrity. Um, the challenge here um, that's, um, you know, particularly acute for Boston is grade with integrity, quote, within their context. Within their context. Um, uh, some uninformed observer would assume that Boston public schools, like most districts, uh, enjoy a common grading system across the district. When, uh, when, and when people marvel that 127 schools produce nearly 127 different grading um, uh, systems, not to not to count, not to include, you know, what are the private schools doing? What are the Catholic schools doing? What on earth are homeschoolers doing? That's the real challenge 
of um, of the GPA that we've been hearing consistently. That's the data. We got to follow the data. Right. No, I'm very clear on the data. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm very clear on the data. Have have research researched it. Um, writ, you know, published white papers. You know, relative to it. Um, but my point is truly, I, I just don't want to, and, and I understand the importance to mitigate relative to it. But I, but I, but I do want to caution us about getting into a conversation that suggests that BPS educators are not grading with integrity, right? Like there is, yes, there is research that you know that that definitely speaks to there being a challenge, but. But I just want to, because I've heard from educators, I just want to be clear, at least from my perspective as a member of this task force, I'm not suggesting that BPS educators are not grading with integrity. Writ large. Within their context. Within their context. Writ large. Ms. Lum. Yes, I want to kind of take a slightly different spin on Dr. Tung's question earlier about tests. And rather than ask Ms. Hogan to um, hazard a prediction on the impact of incorporating MAP or MCAS versus IC, I'm wondering if since MAP is administered, not uniformly, but across some grades, if the district has any takeaways from the testing of MAP um, and performance that might help inform how we might think about the impact of those tests as opposed to, to the IC. Does that question make sense? I can try and clarify if it doesn't. But I guess I'm just trying to see if what are, what are the observations or what is the data suggesting from the MAP tests that have already been um, given across this grade level that we're, we're concerned with, even though it's not given at every school. I mean, Ms. Lum, I, giving the MAP test online today was one of the most horrific experiences I've gone through as a school leader, if I'm being totally honest. With internet going out from home, kids were doing it at home, we were trying to live stream them into a Zoom. I don't know that we could count this year's data in a valid way towards any sort of predictor. Um, with the, I had so many kids who like, finally we were like, it's been an hour, we're, we're, you're not doing this anymore. We're, we're calling the test now. Like this is, there were lots of glitches. And I don't think that that would be data that would help us. And I could say that for many schools, not just mine. Mr. Condom passes. No, I've, uh, uh, I'll take my hand down. Okay. Any others? Okay. And with respect to, um, thank you. And with respect to um, mechanism of allocation, seat allocation, I just wanna call out that we, the simulations are of SES, groupings um, and notice the language change there. Um, tiers are not ranked <laughs> or the groupings are not ranked. So we're just gonna change the language so folks don't get confused. So SES groupings, um, could we put the data back up again, please? The de I'm sorry, the simulations rather, my apologies. Yep. Which um, slide in particular? Or? With respect to, it would be your last, let's look at um, geographic, socioeconomic and racial. Um, again.
pretty consistent with the exception of, albeit with incomplete data, the 2040. Mm -hmm. And then if we look at um, zip code, And folks, you should have this in your inbox. Again, uh, Mr. Contempasas. No, I have a question once this is done. I see. Again, relatively consistent, right? And then next slide, please. What is this? Oh, nice. And I'm sorry, Miss um, Hogan, this is tier five to um, this is option five would if we were to use the other so median household income or and I forget what the other one is. Um, the other option was that index of concentration at the extremes. Yeah. Did uh, we do we have a sense of the impact of those. Yeah, we don't see. Um, major shifts with any of the tier options, um, but I'm happy to make sure that those slides are added um, in tier packet to be, to review. Um, uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is where we do see an impact, a differentiation between, I should say, between the 2080 and the 38, as 30, why oh, keep saying that, 3070. All right, so, I'm sorry between the 2080 and the 100% and the hybrid, my apologies. Between the 2080, the 100%, okay. Um, can, you say Dr. Again, Tom, can you say again what you're concluding from this slide um, and like maybe name the columns that you're looking at? So I'm looking at the row. So I'm looking at column C and column D and I'm looking at row, and I'm looking at the row underneath them, um, where it says 2080, 100%, and then the 2040. So the 2080 is 20% citywide, 80% SES, the 100%, um, and that's straight rank in both of those. The 100% is straight rank within, t within socioeconomic groupings. And the 2040 represents 60% of the seats allocated straight rank, 20% citywide, 40% within SES. Pretty consistent. I think the highest those swing you see is about a 2% swing as between um, column C and column D. Oh, 
otherwise pretty consistent. And then as between, again, kind of the mechanism. All right, Ms. Lum, then Mr. Kanafasas, just let me know when you wanna. No, I, once we through looking at these slides, I have a process okay. question. Okay, Ms. Lum. So I also wanted to just note that across the different weighting models, the 100% column straight rank within tiers does not change much. Mm -hmm. Regardless of the weights that you use. Mm -hmm. It does swing more when you do the 20% citywide and the 80% mm -hmm. within rank. you know, part of the Dr. Tung. So uh, I just want to note that all these, so apparently it's, we're unable to simulate one of our selection mechanisms that was on the table at the end of last meeting, which was the 100% lottery selection mechanism. So am I correct in concluding that we will not like it is it is there something we need that we can get for lottery simulations or we just won't be able to see those so the way the lottery has been discussed has required um, a cutoff or eligibility for students to be in the lottery um, which we don't currently have um, I think beyond that, it, it is um, challenging to simulate a lottery because it will be different each time. Um, but if we would like to explore more um, a cutoff for what that might look like, um, but I believe 100% lottery was not actually one of the 12 requested last week. May I also add something? Yes. My thinking is given the simulations that we've run that anything that includes the lottery, we would not be able to reach consensus. And I would, for one, suggest that looking at this data as we have, I think there is sufficient recognition that from an eligibility perspective, um, we have at least attempted to look at the various percentages that have been asked for. And I would strongly urge that this task force not take a position on a lottery as it happens to be a third rail in this city. My own opinion, but I do think there is sufficient information available here to come up with an eligibility requirement that takes into consideration an assessment, takes into consideration one of at least two um, breakdown percentage wise on the value or the weight of the assessment versus the GPA. And I believe I would echo what Ms. Skerritt mentioned in terms of making certain that we don't choose a percentage that overweights, if you will, 
uh, the GPA. One of the recommendations I heard last Thursday, and I've looked at the data, I think if we looked at from strictly an eligibility perspective, as was suggested, an assessment that was graded and a GPA that was graded with the changes we've made in the GPA regarding grade six moving forward in 23, 24, and certainly including the high poverty indicator that we should possibly reconsider what was suggested on Thursday's meeting and go with a percentage that equates the exam to 30% and 70% on the GPA. That's a process issue. I think we've talked about eligibility. We haven't talked about the invitations, but I'd like to at least, unless there are further considerations, I would like to suggest we take the lottery off of the table and utilize some of the other mechanisms we've talked about vis-a-vis -vis invitations and go forward with an eligibility requirement in 23-24 that incorporates an assessment valued at 30% and a GPA with the changes valued at 70%. So for me on that point, um, I, um, again, I, I understand and deeply appreciate the concerns about um, utilizing a qualified lottery, whether it is from an emotional place, a political place, or a data-driven place, like all of those matter and I get it. Um, if that said, I do still believe that a qualified lottery would be um, the fairest mechanism for the seat allocation. That said, if I look at kind of this in totality, right, looking at eligibility and then looking at mechanism for seat allocation, I would actually be, again, more inclined to support um, an 80-20 split because it's, it's more consistent with what we heard from the experts. If we go with a 70-30, then I do think, again, kind of just looking across the board um, relative to our charge, I would be more inclined to support a solution with 100% straight rank within socioeconomic tiers if it's a 70 30 split. Can you flip back to um, the geographic diversity, please? Thank you. Dr. Tung, you have your hand raised and I see Mr. Kreger, yours is raised as well. Well, my, mine is on a different point from this slide. So do you want me to hold it? Uh, yeah, Mr. Kreger. Very much. It doesn't have to be on this slide, but go ahead, sorry. Oh, sure. I very much appreciate both of our chairs seeking to, you know, move us to decisions tonight so that we can have all of this work wrapped up in time for the school committee to have it presented to them on Wednesday. 
um, I, I would like to put in a vote for seeing what the 2040-40 breakdown looks like, uh, even if it means we have that data tomorrow. Um, I just, I, I like having our options on the table. If we move far enough as a group tonight so that options are taken off the table because we have consensus, I'm not, I'm not standing in the way of consensus, um, but I, I wanna note that request. So you wanna see the lottery, if, if, if there's a way to run this with the yeah. qualified lottery, you wanna see that? Yes, correct. And I don't know what that means the cutoff is to enter a qualified applicant pool when it comes to an IC score, right? I don't, you know, I don't know that we have the equivalent of the B or better on the IC that we've talked about um, in other contexts, but I'm, I'm saying if we don't have consensus, I'd like to have that data available tomorrow if possible. If we don't have consensus on another option. Correct. Yes. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, understood. My concern about that, Mr. Krager, is how do we determine what the qualified score would be for that portion of the groupings that would then be included in the lottery. For the purpose of the simulation or in general? In general. I would I mean, are we looking at B or better as a possibility? I, you know, I'm also sensitive to the fact that we've got to make this as clear as possible to the folks who are going to be using it. Sure. And so what I heard, as I've said, Thursday was the recommendation that we have an assessment and we look at a 30-70 split. That's the eligibility portion. We're now into the invitation portion, which I'm ready to discuss if we have to, but do we, that was my process issue. Do we want to come to consensus on the eligibility or do we want to come to consensus on both the eligibility and the invitation in one fell swoop? I think it's at this stage, it's a package. Okay. Uh, it's a package. Then I would like to then speak strongly for the invitation around the eight tiers, one of which would be determined as we have discussed for homeless students, students under the care of DCF and if possible, those families that live in low income housing. I would like to recommend a 2080 split, 20% 20 citywide, 80% with the number of seats equally determined in each tier, both those processes being by rank order. If indeed there is a discussion around whether that 80% would be split so that half of it would be rank order, the other would be by lottery, the remaining seats in each tier, then we have to determine what a qualified uh, lottery requires. And so I would put on the table, if that's the way people wanna go, that it would be the same as we used with the interim of be a better grade level work. So um, just a note on, on just the, the specialized tier or tiers. So it's DCF and homeless students absolutely pulled out into a tier. As it relates to, it's not low income housing, it would be BHA housing and BHA housing that is within, to address the concerns that we heard about, you know, um, public housing that is in higher income neighborhoods, it would be BHA housing that, it, that 
is located within a within the tier with, within a higher income socioeconomic tier. Yep. Okay. So it, it's pulling. So if you have, so for example, if you have um, Mildred Haley in JP or the McCormick in South Boston, um, you would pull them out if they're in a higher income tier so that they have a specialized tier similar to DCF and homeless students. So just that, um, that note with respect to socioeconomic tiers. Um, the other piece is, you know, I just want to remind us that last week we actually had a few recommendations on the table with respect to a split. It was 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, and 80-20. Um, but by looking at the data um, today, um, again, kind of we see mostly it's fairly consistent we see the most significant impact specifically with respect to socioeconomic when we isolate 70, 30 and 80, 20. I would be more inclined for 80, 20 if we were doing the 20, 80. But if we're going, if, if there's a desire, I'm willing to compromise, if we're willing to, if, if we wanna shift to a 70, 30, then I would suggest straight rank within socioeconomic groupings, which would continue to address the concerns that have been raised about you know, making sure that our top performing students um, in the city have an opportunity to select a seat if they're so inclined. But the impact of doing the socioeconomic 100% socioeconomic in, um, in straight rank is that it gives us yet another opportunity to um, really solidify opportunities for some of our most vulnerable um, children in the city. So I would be inclined to support a 70-30 if there's 100% SES straight rank. Otherwise, I'd be inclined to go with 80-20 with then the 20-80 split. Which actually might be the most straightforward, it's just 20s and 80s. Simple, that's all you would gotta you, remember. <laughs> would you, uh, you, would, you would then suggest that the GPA be worth 80% of this process? Mm -hmm. Yep, 80%. And then, you yeah, would, yeah. and then you would, of course, all of the conversation we've had about uh, some of the manipulation that occur, occurs on the GPA uh, would be, I think, enhanced here. But you're saying if we did that, you would then go with the 2080. Mm -hmm. 20% citywide, 80% equally distributed as we've talked before, straight rank. Straight rank. Why don't we find out how others feel? Uh, Dr. Tung, I see your hand raised. Thank you. Um, so I, I haven't given up on the lottery um, option. Um, I wanted to, uh, address um, the question that Ms. Nagasawa and Ms. Garrett asked last week about how we would factor in um, students who attend high poverty schools. And I, I thought about it more and we could, uh, in, each, in a lottery, each student gets a random number. And so the bump would be to move the students' lottery numbers up by 10% so they get to select earlier. So I just wanted to correct that from last week. And then I also wanted to to make my you know, last ditch argument for a lottery, um, which is that other places do it. There are other selective schools that don't have a test. There are other selective schools that use lottery. And Boston could be one of the districts at the cutting edge willing to do the bold and just thing of eliminating the intractable barrier that is a selective tier of schools. 
So um, there aren't many of them, but I have found a couple that have had lottery as the selection mechanism for years. And they have outcomes to support that they are still successful by the measures that this group cares about. I'll stop there. I reiterate what I have suggested that the term lottery, regardless of what might be happening, San Francisco is in chaos because they have moved to a lottery system for Lowell High School involving the resignation and subsequent rehiring of the superintendent, potential court cases. Dr. Tung, the lottery system, again, in Boston, does, carries with it a great deal of negativity. We have moved the three exam schools and we will continue to move them. And I think implementing a lottery will send the wrong message to the families that make up this community. There are within the processes that we've just outlined effective ways to address our charge without moving toward a practice which we have seen at times can create difficulty within the district. And, you know, I would strongly urge this task force not to include a lottery, but to look at the two options that we have on the table. So Mr. Condepasis, I'm mindful that we do have some hands raised. So I do want to yeah, no, get Miss um, Garrett and then Miss Grassa in here. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think considering uh, the lottery, I want to reference something Ms. Aguirre mentioned a, a few meetings ago, which was the concern about waiting students once they're in a lottery, um, looking for a system that's transparent to all uh, feels um, can potentially confusing and also um, like it may not foster trust to give folks advantages once they're in the lottery, um, a lot more comfortable with retaining a composite score that has the high poverty um, advantage than somehow advantaging in a lottery because I don't think that's easily understood. Um, I also think we can meet our charge without utilizing a lottery. I think when we think about, I, I do recognize that the rest of the district for all schools other than exam schools use a lottery, but I don't think that's one of the features that parents in BPS love. Um, I think it's in fact the opposite. So while it would be more consistent for us to use the lottery um, to match the other parts of school placement that begin as early as K-0, it's not something that folks are very keen on from my understanding. And so I don't think it's necessarily um, seen as cutting edge um, by the parents of Boston, though I do want to acknowledge that we have heard from parents who do support it. Um, I am opposed to a lottery system. Um, I also just um, want to advocate for a system that uses roughly equal weights of assessment and GPA. I want to again mention that the simulations are um, for a time that assumed a 50-50 weight and the more that we assign to grades, um, the more that they are subject to more subjectivity. I do wanna double down on what Mr. Acevedo said. I absolutely trust the integrity of our educators as Ms. Sullivan mentioned, which is very important, but I do think he said it um, very accurately that different school contexts have different grade averages in different schools um, and everyone operates in the context in which they work. It's not an integrity issue. It's just a non-calibration issue. Um, and the more that we weight something to as much as 80%, um, I think we will see more subjectivity across different school types and neighborhoods as we've seen thus far. Um, so I would uh, recommend uh, something that is more roughly equal, a 50-50 or 60-40, um, but I do support either a 20-80 split or 100% by tiers. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is the homeless um, and DCF set aside. Um, because that may not be the same size as the other tiers, 
this may be getting in the weeds, but I wonder if we may want to think of some set aside as opposed to a tier, because it may not be the same size as the other tiers, which can pose a problem. So I wonder if there may be another way for us to think about that, to make sure to lift up those students and families um, without it being um, a challenge in relation to the equal sized eight tiers. Thank you. I, and, and so this is where I'm going to come in as Mr. Contempasas has. For me, it is a non-starter to do 50-50 and it's a non-starter for 60-40. I just wanna put that on the table. Ms. Grassa. I know everyone already knows how I feel about the lottery. I think if we're, we're saying we want this to be simple and clear to people, I think a qualified lottery continues to make sense. Um, I know not everyone here loves that. Um, I, I totally understand how people feel about the lottery, but we have feelings about uh, selective <laughs> schools in general. Um, we have feelings about um, the current process we did for one year, the process we've had for the last, I don't know, 20 years and whatever processes, processes existed before that. So there's definitely always feelings, but if we're thinking about simplistic, um, focusing on students, um and just their own understanding of that i think it is very important um if i ha i will i am obviously willing to entertain some of the other options but i didn't want to leave my plug for the lottery out um i think that the 80 20 plan or the 100 percent plan there's not really a huge difference when you looked at those charts um i understand that we can't really do a simulation with the lottery part that's that i i understand um, but there was not a huge difference when you looked at across the board of 50, 50, 40, 60, 30, 70, or 80, 20. Um, there was not a significant difference that I could see across any of the, uh, I don't know, was it 12 different options we had on there? Um, so I would say I'm more of a 40, 60 person, um, in that category of where I think we should fall between, uh, the assessment and grades. Also, I feel like I heard today for the first time, which new was this homeless, students in DCF custody, anyone living in Boston housing, um, kind of having its own tier. And I would just say, before we add anything new to the table, I think it's super important that we check with Monica about like, can this be implemented? Like how would, I know our job is not to implement the plan, but it's important that we create a plan that can be implemented. So I'm curious to just see how the implementation of that would go. So Ms. Grasa, just for the record, we've been talking about the DCF homeless and BHA for, I don't know, weeks now as part of, um, in continuing that, carrying that over from the interim policy. But I, once we moved to tiers, I thought that that came off the table. So nope, that's... It, was part of, it was part of the tier conversation from the beginning actually. Well, I'm still curious about the implementation and how, how that would play out. Yeah. So again, I'm going to be like Mr. Condon Passes on the lottery, 60-40, 50-50. Um, um, there's no way that I'm there. Just want to be clear. I, I, won't, I won't talk as long as he does about the lottery, though. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, anyone else thoughts? What you got, Ms. Lum? Um, all feelings on lottery aside, I'm just curious to know if school age children concentrations in neighborhood would impact neighborhood diversity if we went to lottery, meaning that neighborhoods with more school age children would get a higher representation in the school in in the invitee process than going by a more prescribed formula okay so what i'm i'm hearing a lot of interest in the lottery from the group i mean and it, it, don't ignore mr content process it's I, we know where he stands but i just want to i i mean it, it's it's interesting to me because i didn't realize there was that much support for the exploration of the lottery and so 
I mean, so I don't think, I mean, I've heard one, two, I've heard almost half of the group express an interest. So I'm not sure that it's something that we can just put to the side, Mr. Kandabasis, I'm sorry, given that, and I understand fully what you've explained or talked about and, and agree, this is a hot button issue. But with so much interest, I do think we, we got to talk it out. We got to talk it out. Simon, we haven't heard from you yet today. So you're up. Sorry, been a little quiet today. He's getting to me. But um, I also thought that I was a proud lottery person from the beginning, but I thought that was off the table. So if it's still on the table and people still want to talk about it, I'm here for that conversation. Okay. Uh, Miss uh, Dr. Freeman Wisdom. I'm going to those who we haven't heard from yet today first, and then we'll go. Dr. Freeman Wisdom. Hey, good evening. Um, I am I am not in favor of a lottery. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that was noted. Um, but in terms of the, um, the split, um, Tanisha, you came, you, you said, you gave a scenario with the 70-30. I cannot recall what it was. Um, maybe it'll come back up and if it does, I'll just raise my hand. But right now where I am is at 60-40 with, look, and then looking at, it can be any of the, um, the other uh, breakdowns um, from the slide that, from the slide that had like the 20, 40, 100 and 20, 80. But there was something that you said about the, um, the, the 70, 30 that um, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll ask it again. But um, that's where I am in terms of my, that's just my way in. Yeah, so the only thing I remember saying, specifically calling out the 70, 30 and the 80, 20 was that the, there is a noticeable, or there was a noticeable difference in the simulations from an economic, mm -hmm. um, on, the, on the slide that has the economically advantaged, economically disadvantaged numbers, that's where you see the most, I mean, um, kind of impact is on socioeconomic status. I do recall, it was that what you're referring no, to? No, you were talking about, you would go, you would, you're- Ah, yes. certain way. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, what I, okay, so on that, what I said is if it's 70-30, grades assessment, mm -hmm. then I could support, I could support that if we did on the mechanism mm -hmm. in socioeconomic tiers, 100% yep. straight rank within the tiers. All right, thank you. That's what I needed to hear again. Yeah. So I'm gonna look back at my slide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Nagasawa, then Mr. Acevedo, then Dr. Tung. I will quickly say that, I will quickly say that I will echo Mr. Kreger's request, if possible, to try to run a simulation for the lottery because I, I'm not totally opposed to it and I'm definitely interested to see how that would play out. I, I, I could, I think I could support like a 20, 40, 40. Um, and also I'm more inclined to the 30, 70 G, uh, test and GPA. Mr. Acevedo. I would, um, so I, I've been sort of um, reserving word uh, here with respect to the lottery, which I, um, uh, I, I, I also want to be on the record as, as opposing, um, because I, I believe that we can, as has been expressed now by half, I mean, half of the task force, if we're, you know, I, I don't know if we're scientifically half and half on lottery. No, but that actually would be more that, well, I, all I'm, all I'm mean, just to share where where I am. I, I, I share, I share the, I, I share great, great discomfort around, it and always have. Um, I, be, I do believe uh, that if we're going to do this, I would agree, Miss um, Sullivan, with a one hundred percent, you know, straight 
set aside a little bit for tears. Uh, I think that, that I think that makes sense. I'd be I feel comfortable with the seven thirty. Um, uh, split between the um, assess, you know grades and assessment. Um, but I, I think we can achieve these ends without, um, you know, if, if it, uh, to find a simulation that would tell the story accurately in Boston. I, I mean, I heard Miss, Miss uh, Hogan loud and clear at the beginning of this evening and how difficult that would be. And part of what that makes, makes it difficult, especially this, this very this this late in our game is um, uh, to be able to do just you know fair comparisons with um, communities anywhere near similar to Boston and and um, I'm you know I heard Mr. Contempasis and um, frankly if there's if there's something to what he shared about San Francisco, I would be concerned. And I think there's a city that would be concerned as well at introducing that system here in Boston, if we could achieve the same ends or better without it. And just as boldly and just as heroically, we'll have plenty of enemies <laughs> if we go with, with a 70-30 system 100%, you know, uh, set aside with the tears and they set aside for DCF and homeless students, I think is wonderful. I think that is bold. And, and I think that, that that's going to be the most, if we do something like that, it will be the most equitable admission system that the exam schools have seen in 400 years. And we could do that without the messiness of trying to contemplate a lot of it. So I do want to call out, I, I was actually incorrect. It is actually a majority of the task force that is has an interest in um, a qualified lottery. So I, I just, I just, you know, I don't want to um, be in a situation where um, where that's being ignored. Um, so I, I definitely want to honor that. Um, Oh gosh, give me one moment, please. Uh, Dr. Tung and then Ms. Lum, sorry. Um, I've, I've heard um, a lot of the task force members um, be more agnostic towards the 20% citywide or 100% socioeconomic grouping. And um, I won't, repeat what I've said in past meetings, pointing to slides and data that show how 20% citywide is, um, does not bring us closer to equity. But I just wanna say again, in a city with roots in colonialism and with intractable residential and educational segregation, a level playing field is generations away if we stick to short-term reforms and incremental policy changes and reserving 20% citywide seats for white and privileged students is certainly better than the old method of reserving 100% of citywide seats. But let's be honest, we'll still be setting aside seats for those who already benefit the most from structural racism and capitalism. So I'm, I'm gonna, if people are agnostic, I'm pushing for 100% socioeconomic groupings. I want to clarify my position here. While I, I think what I'm really, personally, I'm leaning against the lottery and I just want data to reinforce my thinking along those lines. I also want to say that I feel a lottery is, because of its randomized selection process, does not um, ensure the diversity along socioeconomic lines, along neighborhoods at all. 
you could have one year where you might be really well balanced. You can have another year where where those those um, demographics are no longer balanced. And I think a lottery works if you're in a homogenous society, but we know through these very many weeks and months of conversation that Boston is anything but a homogenous society. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chernow and then Mr. Contempasas. Yeah, real quick, just responding to Ms. Lum, I think that the lottery would take place in tiers. So we would still be able to gain that sort of, um, Char we would still be able to gain our charge of diversity around neighborhoods, around socioeconomic status, because it would still be the same percentage of students as in those tiers, so it would have no impact on that whatsoever. It would simply be a lottery in those tiers, just for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Contempasis. Yes. Um, in, in the interest of trying to move this along, I, first of all, um, I continue to oppose a lottery in any way. And let me read to you two small paragraphs from the opinion editorial page of Thursday's June 24th Globe. Now you all know the exam schools are not necessarily the pet project of the Globe, but they wrote two individual paragraphs that I'd like to share. One of them has to do with the lottery. And I quote, ultimately though, that element of chance, meaning the lottery, makes the approach less compelling. It would make admissions feel beyond the control of the individual student and render the policy politically tenuous as a result. And on the 2080 split, they wrote, this 2080 split similar to a system used in Chicago is a good idea and should be included in the task force recommendation. The 20% set aside gives the district's highest achieving students something to aim for while leaving plenty of room for greater access. Now I respect Dr. Tung's political point of view, but indeed when one talks about the district's highest achieving students, we're not talking only about white privileged students. We're talking about students from all backgrounds, neighborhoods, ethnicities, and so I would argue on uh, one last point. We are now at a point where additional simulations run against the time clock that we're trying to uh, meet the deadline. And I would certainly respect the fact that folks have to put these recommendations together and that will take some time prior to its going to the superintendent and prior to its going to the school committee. We have reached the 11th hour here. We've heard lots of good suggestions. They also suggested in this same editorial that it would be a mistake to overemphasize grades, particularly talking about the grade inflation that we all know exists out there. So I come back to the fact that there are two, the way I look at it, two proposals on the table. If indeed there is to be a proposal regarding the uh, lottery, I don't see how we get around it other than voting. I'd like to avoid that. And I'd like to focus on the two proposals that I've heard. And with all due respect to everyone, 
I emphasize that we've got to reach consensus this evening. And so I've heard either a 3070 or a 4060. No, I have personally. No, 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 no. I said 8020. I'm sorry. You're right. My error. I've heard 2080, 3070. I personally support the 3070. I've also heard that there is at least concern around the 2080, which appeared to have some measure of success in the interim plan. I hold to the 2080 rank order without the lottery. I've heard that maybe we want to do 100%. Those are the two issues that I think we have to hammer out. But anything beyond that, in my opinion, is beyond the scope of the work that we have to get done between now and whenever we finish sometime this evening. And again, I don't know how we get around the lottery issue unless we take a vote. And I will further indicate what I've said before. And that is, it's a third rail in this town and we are trying to build a system that works for the students in the city and meets our charge. We've done that. And the simulations tend to show, albeit they are indeed, uh, uh, you know, could be uh, off a bit. They do reflect an increase in the diversity that we're seeking to improve access and also improve the educational experience of these students. I don't know where that leaves us, folks. Uh, Ms. Garrett's hand is raised. And then Mr. Freger. Thank you. Um, as we are kind of digging into this um, tough decision point around the lottery or no, um, I do think that, and, and Ms. Hogan, please correct me if I'm wrong, it looks like from the from the partial simulation of the 20-40-40 split, that the second half within tiers does elevate the number of socioeconomically disadvantaged students in each tier. So we would be moving to lottery um, before um, we get to many of the students we were looking to advantage. And I again want to um, go back to the point that everyone's advantage in the high poverty indicator gets negated once we move to a lottery system. Um, and so I just wanted to um, just raise up that data point because I know we all have our, our strong opinions, but if we are letting the data inform our decision-making, what it looked like was that the first 40% of each tier does have more economically advantaged students and the second half of the tier has more economically disadvantaged students. So if we go to a lottery for the second half of the tier, we could be inadvertently disadvantaging economically disadvantaged students. So just to be clear, I, do, I wanna lift up what Simon shared earlier. This would, if there is a lottery, what I've heard is that it wouldn't be citywide, it would be within socioeconomic tiers. So it wouldn't, it, 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 there would not be an adverse impact on socioeconomic diversity. What I'm, what I'm referring to, Ms. Sullivan, is that the 40% in the 20-40-40 splits, what we saw in almost all of the simulations was mm -hmm. that they had more economically advantaged students once you stopped at 40%, which suggests that the balancing starts, not balancing, I shouldn't use that word, that, the, um, that more economically disadvantaged students when using a composite score get invited to the, to the exam schools when you go through the entire tier, um, the entire, the totality of that tier using composite scores. So I don't know if we could pull it up again, maybe I'm looking at it incorrectly, but 
but we saw a model where stopping at 40% actually was the least advantageous model for economically disadvantaged students. So I just wanted to, you know, so then we're now going to a randomized process for the second half of each tier, which is the tier that would have actually admitted more economically disadvantaged students. I do understand that it's by tier, but even within that tier, that looked consistent in the modeling. Right, it looks consistent in the modeling, but it's 40% of the seats not being allocated. And that 40% is intentionally, if there's a lottery using the tiers, it is intentionally designed to increase socioeconomic diversity. So you, so, so there, the, the impact of the qualified lottery within a tier is it, it we're not I, I we won't see the impact on socioeconomic we may see it on geographic and we may see it on racial and ethnic diversity but on socioeconomic diversity it will it, it is very likely to remain constant i think that that's up to the chance of a lottery ball using when when we have the simulations using the full tier that show a better comp a more advantageous composition of economically disadvantaged students using either the 2080 split or the 100. So it, it is a randomized process, so it may or, or may not do that. It's a randomized process within socioeconomic bands. So you're gonna have, like you're gonna get, I mean, unless, right, if you have a band that is lower income students, median household income of let's say, you know, let's do low, low, eight, to $15,000 a year, right? A lottery within that tier is going to very likely, going, going to yield you a low, a very low income pool of students from a very low income families are going to come out of that tier because the tier is designed to catch those students. So you, you're not gonna see shifts there from a socioeconomic standpoint. This looks like the composite did that um, in a more guaranteed way. So I'm, I'm just not sure what we're gaining. Mr. Krager, then Ms. Lum. I'm gonna speak briefly and technically um, to Ms. Garrett's point. I think the socioeconomic tiering, as this group knows, is focused on census tracts and not individual families. So. What Ms. Garrett was pointing out was the disproportionately, let's say, high uh, um, socioeconomic advantage present in the first 60% of the seats in the 2040-40 model. Meaning that even in our neighborhoods of lower socioeconomic status, it's the students of higher socioeconomic status that are disproportionately getting the first 60% of seats in that model. And so the, the drop in the lottery, right? Like the, the lottery may not further it. Right? So just to, just to, to, you know, to restate, um, uh, the, the, second, the second piece is just a question, right? Um, like Ms. Grassa, I heard we were working to set up a, 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 a way to include our DCF students, our homeless students, and the interest in involving our students living in BHA, particularly when they are in a, their public housing is in a tier that is otherwise not reflective of their socioeconomic status. But I too didn't hear how that was gonna work. Is that a separate tier? Is it incorporated into tier one, let's say? Um, I, I just want to understand the mechanics of that and come back to Ms. Grass's question. And I, perhaps this is a question for Ms. Hogan. No, so it is it's this, it would be the same mechanism we use with respect to the zip codes, right? Where we created a specialized zip code for DCF and homeless students. In this instance, it would be a specialized tier for DCF homeless students and um, students who are in BHA housing that is situated within the higher income socioeconomic bands. To the question with respect to, so that's the same thing we did 
with the interim policy. With respect to the concern relative to equal distribution of the seats, which is another kind of um, another factor of using the SES tiers is that there would be equal number roughly. Um, it's not going to be perfect. I want to be on the record with that. Um, it would depend upon, as with all of these, how many students we have that are applying that are you know that are kind of in the pool who would fit into those respective demographics if we find that we have you know an overwhelming number of dcf homeless and bha students that would qualify for the specialized tier then the from an operational standpoint the bps would need to you know split the tier so that you have kind of those again, kind of roughly equal, equal weights. But what we, I mean, it is not within our charge to determine what the, what the, um, the range is when it comes to um, the allocation of seats within a specific tier. What we can direct is that, or what we can recommend is that each of the tiers as closely as possible has an equal number of seats and that they make the, the necessary adjustments for that to be the case. I don't see any more hands raised. Mr. Chernow. Um, I just guess going back to the lottery conversation that we've kind of been in and out of, um, I guess I'll just, state my continued support for um the lottery and i wanted to add one more thing that i think was why i was originally drawn to the lottery like a few months ago when i brought this up was that it kind of affects for it takes into the confederation grade inflation because in a rank system grade inflation has a much higher impact on how students get brought so earlier in the conversation people brought up the, the point about how we, we can't, it's not on the educators, but we can't control how certain schools do their grade system, right? It's, every school is different. In a lottery system, it doesn't matter necessarily because all the students in the pool are with their socioeconomic economic group and they're all on grade, on grade ready to learn, but they may not have the same exact GPA and that's okay because they're all on grade level. So that's definitely another boost to using a lottery system is that it kind of factors out rate inflation. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> I wanna wanna call an audible, Mr. Contempasis. <laughs> um, and do something a little different than how we've done this before. I kind of want to go to public comment to hear, like, what are people, what are, what are, like, is there, are there any suggestions out there? And then come back to try to maybe get to a decision. What do you think, or would you prefer to keep going, Mr. Contempasis? I think we uh, we need to keep going, Ms. Sullivan. Okay, as all right. Difficult as it may be. Okay. Um, we've had five months of testimony. Indeed. We'll have more. Uh, <laughs> we're not developing a perfect system. Right. We're developing a system that addresses as best we can the charge that we have. And so, again, um, would it be helpful if we tried to limit this conversation to what perhaps might be two of the uh, proposals that are on the table? I mean, I've heard opposition to the 4060. Uh, I haven't heard any opposition to the 3070. There may be some out there. 
but I certainly have heard opposition to the 2080. And so in the well, interest of- just just a clarifying point. So, so again, I'm not looking at it just from an eligibility standpoint. I'm, I, I, I could be supportive of the 70-30 if we're doing 100% straight rank within SES tiers. That's how I could be comfortable with 7030. Otherwise I'm opposed to 7030 as well. So I just want to put that's, that up. That's one position. Yep. Yeah. That's I just one. I just want to make sure that sure. Yeah. just as we all know where you stand, everyone knows where I stand on this. Yep. No, no, this is it's perfectly <laughs> correct that you should do so. Uh, the other position that I think we've talked about is uh, the, the uh, 3070 with the 2080, everything in rank order. In the 8020 with. Oh, you said, you said with the yep. 8020, you 80, go with 20 that. with your 2080. Yep. Mm hmm. Ms. Lum. If, if this is booming us backwards, feel free to shoot it all down. But I don't know if for the matter of official record from a process perspective, if it makes sense to take an interim vote on the lottery in and of itself as a uh, mechanism and having us reach consensus that if the lottery does not have a majority vote that we will agree to come to consensus on an alternate mechanism not including the lottery why don't we do it the other way around what's the other way <laughs> well the other way is to consider the proposals that we've just put on the table because there has been particularly very strong perspective both ways around the lottery. And I would just think we can get there without really having to take a vote on the lottery. I would rather try to reach consensus on the two what I consider to be two um, viable propositions, given the data we've seen, and whether indeed, I think the stumbling block here is, do we accept 2080 under the conditions of 100% straight rank in the groups, or do we accept uh, 2080 with uh, the 2080 perspective without the lottery? Or do we go 30? I'm sorry, I've screwed that up. I'll yeah. go back. 3070 <laughs> with 100% in the groups by straight, uh, by straight uh, rank. Mm -hmm. Or 2080 with a 20% citywide, 80% straight rank in the groups. Those are the two proposals I would put on the table. So let's talk about those. Let's talk about those. Um, and so, and let's talk about those. Okay. Um, Ms. Garrett, Mr. Chernow. Okay. I'll zoom in on those um, since we're going in, in that direction. Um, I oppose the 80-20 emphasis for the reasons uh, for the concerns about grades that I named before. Um, and it's, um, it's regardless of a 20-80 citywide split. Um, I'm uncomfortable with an 80% waiting on grades. I don't think we've seen any data that shows that it advantages, disadvantaged students to um, wait grades based on what we've seen of grade distribution in the city. Um, I 
do think it's tough without understanding what we're doing with the lottery to land on a model for me, um, but I'll, um, I'll keep listening. So let's take lottery, let's put lottery on the side for now. On mechanism, we're looking at 100% SES tier allocation or a 2080. In each of those, it's a straight rank. So put lottery to the side for a moment, for a moment. Mr. Chernow. Um, putting lottery to the side, I support 80-20 with 100% rank. That's not one of the options on the table. Okay, so. then 80-20 with the 80-20. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you. Ms. Aguirre. I, I don't feel comfortable with the 80-20 by the same result that uh, Ms. Kerry has been, has been mentioning. Okay. And what about allocation? I will I will be open to a 2080 or a 100 straight rank. Okay. Uh, Ms. Grassa, up down. Yeah, I I don't feel comfortable with the 2080 or 8020. I, we're talking with grades. You're yes. talking about the yes. grades. Yes. Yes. Um, for the same reasons as Miss Aguirre and Miss Garrett. And what about allocation package here, folks? Where it's package. Sorry. Remind me what the allocation options are. Hundred percent straight rank in tier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could get behind hundred percent straight rank in tier. Any other thoughts? Where are we, Mr. Craiger? Look, if we're doing this, right? Um, I, we're I, getting this done. I get it. I get it. No, I see it. Um, uh, and if 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 this is what we're doing, I I too favor one hundred percent rather than twenty eighty, if only because I don't think we want to set up a dynamic where we've got first class and then the rest of the of the plane. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I will agree with Mr. Kreger and Ms. Tung. Um, I don't like the 80 top citywide, so I prefer to do the 100% 30, 30 70 split. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lum? I'm on the same page as Ms. Nagasawa, 70-30 with the GPA 70 and 100% by tier, straight rank. Mr. Chernow, your hand's back up. Yeah, I changed my mind about... I'd okay. rather have 100% rank, 100% rank than 80-20. Okay, so you're on the 30-70. Okay. Oh, we might be getting there. We might, Sam, Mr. Acevedo. 100% straight rank and uh, the 70-30. Dr. Freeman Wisdom, Ms. Garrett. Ah, uh, if those, if we're looking at those, um, I'd have to go 30, 70. I'm still going to say I'm 60, 40. I just want to put that out there. Um, but I would, if it's the choice of the two, then it would be the 30, 70 with the test and the grades. And it would be um, straight rank, but it's, it's hard. I just want to acknowledge that it's hard to say that, not mm -hmm. knowing about the whole lottery piece, because I am not in favor of a lottery. So that would not be inclusive a lot of a lottery. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Garrett. I'll echo Dr. Freeman Wilson. Okay. All right. Ms. Wade, Dr. Tung, do you want to weigh in here? Miss, I think we've heard from everybody else. I think I'm like in the 3070 as well. Okay. So can we? Dr. Tung, unless you want to weigh in, we have, let me just say this. None of us is doing, we're, no bat flips over here, okay? But <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> no bat flips. I don't know if I could do a bat, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so if we isolate 70-30, 
100% SES tiers, 100% straight rank in the tiers um, with the specialized tier for our most vulnerable students, the DCF, homeless, BHA housing within higher socioeconomic bands. Can we rest? Yes. Can we rest? I'm coming, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I haven't forgotten about the other piece, but. What's the other piece? Well, Mr. Chernow. The lottery. <laughs> I saw him looking at me, so. <laughs> <laughs> through through the Zoom. Yep. Yeah. I haven't forgotten about that. But in terms of just isolating the okay, Mr. Gere. Yeah, I mean I was hearing some support for a 6040. Can we put that on the table or is it completely out of the table? It is not on the table. Unless you all want to go through that exercise again, 6040. We can do that. Do you want to do that? Okay, let's go. 60, 40 with what? Because I've already made clear that that is a non-starter for me. So just letting y'all know. So 60, 40 with, just like for Mr. Compton Passes, a lottery is a non-starter. So just, so before anybody says, how come she gets to say what's a non-starter for her? I just wanna remind everybody that Mr. Compton Passes has made clear what's a non-starter for him. Okay. Cause you know, that's what folks are saying. Um, 60, 40, um, what's the, I'm just saying, cause you know, they are, um, 60, 40 and with what type of mechanism, Mr. Gere? Uh, same as the, for, as, as for the 30, 70. Okay. So hundred percent. All right. So that's where, that's where you are. Mr. Gere. Okay. Sam, Mr. Acevedo. I will stick to the 70-30, as I said earlier. Okay. Any others for 60-40? I'm for 60-40. That would be me as well. Mm. And Ms. Garrett, did I see you on that? Anybody else? I just have a question. Is it 60-40 with 100% straight rank? Correct. Okay. Anybody else in favor of that versus the 70-30? Okay, so we're gonna put 60-40 to bed. Now let's talk lottery. 70-30, 100% straight rank, vis-a-vis, -vis, I need, so there are many things that we've discussed re related to the lottery. The one that I'm, I'm gonna pull up would be qualified and tell me, actually, Simon, you put it on the table, one option relative to lottery. Ooh. Pressure. I would say 100%. I don't, I don't know if people are gonna be on board with that. Can we get a gauge the room if I say 100% lottery? That can so, be a so we've talked about this for several weeks, sir. So you can, what you've heard is, right, we've had the conversation about, you've heard 100%, and this is all qualified lottery. You've heard 100% qualified lottery within tiers. We've also talked about having a hybrid, but since we've taken 2080 off the table, the only thing that would be left would be 100%. Okay, so 100% in tears for the lottery. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, that's what, but it's your your recommendation to put on the table, sir. Yeah, that's my recommendation. 100% lottery in tears. In tears, okay. And that would be your preference. Is there additional support for that? Again, vis-a-vis vis vis the 70, 30, 100% SDS tier straight rank. Dr. Tom. Yes. Ms. Grasso. Any other support for that versus the 
I'm sorry, Ms. Sullivan, what do you mean when you say versus the 730? Can you just explain that? So we have narrowed this down to 7030. Sorry, at this we have a halo coming in. Don't y'all like that? The skies are parting because we're getting there. So 70% grades, 30% assessment on mechanism, 100% straight rank allocation within tiers or qualified lottery 100% within tiers. With a 70-30 split for a composite score, Simon? Well, if with a 70 you would still, you would still need the you, Right, to kind of get your, yeah, to get your pool. Mm -hmm. But 100% qualified lottery within tiers. Yep, I'm sorry. Can't vote for that. Okay. Is there any additional support? I heard yeah. from Ms. Grassa, Dr. Tung, and Simon. Any additional support for that over the 70-30 with 100% straight rank? Okay, no. So then that means we're taking that off the table. So where we're left, folks, is... 70, I'm trying to, I don't know how to fix this, sorry. 70, 70, so on eligibility, composite score, that is 70%, that weights GPA 70%, assessment 30%, plus, as we had already come to consensus on, a 10%, um, a 10 factor, for students who attend a school that is high poverty, meaning 50% or more of the students within that school are economic are, are, are defined as high poverty. Okay. Composite score. Then students would be put into socioeconomic tiers and ranked by their composite score and seats would be allocated accordingly. What we haven't talked about is the order in which, in which the, um, the tiers would select their seats. I would recommend that we use the process that was used for the interim policy, which was 10 rounds, 10% of the seats allocated in each round, students in the lowest socioeconomic tier would choose first. Any objection to that? I'm sorry, would you please repeat that, Ms. Mm -hmm. Sullivan? Um, yes. And, and we're talking still about fall 2022, correct? 23, 24. 23, 24. 24. Okay. Okay, so my recommendation would be that we use the same process we use for the interim policy, where we have 10 rounds of seat allocation, 10% of the seats allocated in each round. Students from the lowest socioeconomic tier would choose first. So your DCF and homeless students would choose first, 10 rounds. Someone will say why 10, because it's just easier. I have a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, in that ordering of tiers, when would the groupings for homeless DCF and BHA students, when would they come into that? It would go first, which is how it works this year with the interim policy. Mr. Hey, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Sullivan. No, I was calling on you. May I ask if we're doing 100% straight rank within each tier, mm -hmm. are we still talking about an equal number of seats in each tier within reason? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then why do we have to have any particular order if the designation to the tier is school detailed. choice, school choice, school choice.
But that would still hold, wouldn't it, within the tiers? No. I mean, the tiers are only going to be whatever the number of seats are. And I try. Yes. Not, go ahead. Somebody else try. Ms. Garrett, no, you you you're dealing with three schools in totality. So every student's decision impacts the number of seats remaining at the school. Um, so taking a number like 10 um, allows multiple rounds to occur um, to maximize access for all tiers, um, regardless of who goes first. If you try to set a specific number of seats by school, it would not work um, because the preference by student and family impacts the future available seats after each person's choice. So you have to, you can't fill every seat for an entire tier, or you could um, basically box out another tier based on school preference. So I, I agree with Ms. Sullivan's recommendation to maintain our, um, our formula or, or assignment process that we use for the temporary policy by taking a number that's high and easy to understand like 10 um, and doing a rotational process. Thank you for explaining that. Dr. Tong, I see your hand up. Um, could someone do the same thing that Ms. Garrett just did and explain to me how we landed on tiers as being better than zip codes? I, I missed that. Ms. Garrett, and then I'm actually, after this, I'm actually, because it is quarter past seven, I'm actually going to ask that we take just a five minute recess because I just if we can if we can do that but Miss Garrett I think that um, there were two things um, that came up uh, around concerns related to the zip code and the temporary policy that I would name um, one is the small n size of zip codes um, that really drill down when you're talking about a thousand seats can get to very small margins um, with our small city and the number of zip codes that we have in a way that became slightly uncomfortable uh, in terms of allocating seats by something that small, which was one of the things that kind of turned us away from individual census tracts and dealing with numbers larger, like eight tiers that still leaves, you know, more than a hundred seats per tier um, so that it was less, um, it was less exclusive, um, so to speak. Um, the other concern around zip codes that came up um, was when you do have a zip code that has those extremes that Ms. Lum has been discussing in terms of high and low income in one zip code. And we saw that work adversely for communities where that is exacerbated. Um, I'll name Charlestown as one as a small zip code that has very um, extreme um, income by families um, where low income students were potentially disadvantaged with such a small number of seats um, within the zip code. So those were two things that I, preferred with the tiers as they were larger, but still respected the socioeconomic differentiation to the greatest degree that we can, understanding that we can't get down to the individual student. Thank you. Okay. So Ms. Sullivan, you would like to take a five minute break? Yes, please. Can can, uh, before we do that, can we summarize where we are? Sure. We are now talking about the order in which seats, the order in which the tiers would select the seats. No, I think, I think we're- I, Oh, are we I, done with that? I'm under, I understand it now. Oh, okay. I understand why. Okay, all right. Okay. What I'd like to do is where are we with the options that were on the table? So we are 70-30, 70% grades, 30% assessment, 100% on the allocation of the seats, 100% um, allocation of seats by SES tier straight rank. SES tiers will, students in SES tiers will choose their seats in 10 rounds 
with the um, lowest SES tier or band choosing first, reverse order. That's where we are. Ms. Grasa, is this um, germane to this topic or can we take our quick break? We can take a quick break. Mr. Acevedo, is this germane or can we take a quick break? It is germane. Okay. I guess my question is, once we take our break, what else is there? Oh, we have. <laughs> we, I, I really want to, I feel like I'm at Vegas. I really want to take my wings. You want to, and go. I go to bed. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> just, Listen. Whatever I, happens in Vegas, just leave it there and <laughs> take my winnings upstairs. So what's. Please give you know, me, please, please just give me five minutes. Please, 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 please. And then right. we'll come back to the roulette table. Okay. And then we'll come on back. Everybody take a five minute file break, get some water, <laughs> stretch, stand up. We still have public comment and we still need to just button up the um, the other components of the recommendation. So, so we'll come back at 726-ish. Right. And everybody can go on mute. Okay, perfect.
Hey folks, um, just one more second, please. Thanks.
truly, truly apologize. Um, all right. Um, I know that there are hands, I know there are hands raised. Um, I wanna get to the hands um, and then we will um, go to public comment and then we'll talk kind of next steps. And, um, and we'll be back together tomorrow, no doubt. Okay, um, Ms. Grassa. I just want to request for tomorrow, could we have a one pager of all of the decisions we've made? Just because I think as we go through, um, mm -hmm. I, I, me and Mr. Craig were confused about some things. I think Mr. Cherno mentioned there was something he thought was off the table um, throughout the time today. I think if we just had a one pager of everything we agreed on so that tomorrow when we close out, we're all very, very clear about everything we have agreed on. Yep. If that's possible, thank you. Agreed, indeed. Ms. Lum. I would also like to add to that request, the decisions we still need to make. I think most outstanding might be the 20, the, the this year's applicant pools process um, being amongst that. Dr. Tung. And if there's going to be a recommendation to the school committee on Wednesday night that involves slides, um, maybe um, some way to document what what the slide headers would be so that we can weigh in on that too. Okay. Um, Ms. Grassi, your hand is still raised. Okay. Are there additional comments? All right. Um, let's go to public comment. Ms. Parvex. Thank you. We have two speakers this evening. Each speaker will have two minutes per person. I would remind you when you have when they have 20 seconds left. Please state your name and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also make sure you're signed into Zoom with the same name you used to sign up for public comment. That will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. I will move you up as a panelist and would ask you to turn on your camera for public comment. Our first speaker is Sunny Thai. Um, Funny. Hmm. Just a second. I think he disappeared just as I called on him. Because now I can find. We'll give him a moment to, to come back. Oh, there he is. There he is, yes. Thank you. Can you repeat the instruction? Yes. Oh, do we lose him again? No, I think he's opening up his camera. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, Perfect. can you turn on your camera, please? Thank you. Sorry, it was just loading really slowly. Um, hi, my name is Sunny Pai. I've been a teacher, principal, a high school administrator in BPS for the last 22 years, uh, the last 11 at Charlestown High. I'm also the proud parent of a rising second grader and fourth grader at the Curly K-8, who are very excited to know that Ms. Grassa is on the Zoom that I've been on since five o'clock, and I live in Jamaica Plain. Um, I've been watching this entire meeting, and first I just want to thank you for your service on this task force. And whether I agree with you personally or not, I certainly respect the enormous commitment you've made to attend these meetings and to engage in this discussion. Um, I prepared remarks, but then after watching, it kind of changed them. So I, I watched a simulation presentation at first that seemed to clearly show that among many options, there was no discernible difference in invitation pool by race, but there was a noticeable difference by socioeconomic status. And I saw that it seemed that a lottery gave greater access to students in poverty. I then watched Mr. Contempasis immediately seek to take lottery off the table and called it a third rail and I watched him talk about San Francisco. He used the phrase, we don't want to send the wrong message. 
I later saw Mr. Acevedo mention San Francisco and say that we should avoid messiness. And I, to be honest, I became incredibly angry because I felt like I was watching how systemic oppression stays in place unfold in front of me. Now, if those who have an unfair advantage now lose that advantage, they will be upset. They will gripe, they will fight, they will fight well because they have lots of resources and they're used to winning. And it will be incredibly messy and that's the nature of systemic oppression. I'm floored that there were not more than two other people willing to consider Mr. Cherno's proposal of the 100% lottery or whatever it was. The data simulation shows that this is how we best give students in poverty a chance. I fully understand incremental change. I fully understand that even bold change, that's not the boldest of change. And if the proposal that eventually passes is 70-30 with no 20% set aside, have no doubt I will celebrate and praise the work of this task force. That would not be incremental change. It would be a monumental victory. But I will remember watching this moment when systemic oppression was maintained and out of fear of mess, out of fear of anger. Maybe on the task force, I would have even chosen the same thing, but I will still be sad because there's those who need us to fight for them and we're not fighting for them. And instead of bowing to those who already have it good and want to keep it that way. What I had hoped to talk about tonight was just to talk about how the exam schools, if we say that the best of the best are an all-star team, if you will. That last year I noticed that 0% of seventh grade invitations went to English learners. Only 2% of seventh grade invitations went to students with IEPs. And this year with the draft policy or the one year policy, 7% of seventh grade invitations went to English learners and 4% went to students and IEPs. Now that's still a small percentage compared to Charlestown, which has 40% English learners and 28.5 students and IEPs. But I was still overjoyed to see that students who are learning English and students who have some sort of dis learning disability are getting access. The best of the best should include the best from all across Boston, every neighborhood, every race, every kind of learner. I've met brilliant English learners and brilliant students with IEPs, and I'm glad we're considering policies that allow the very best of these students to be part of the exam school experience. I'm concerned about the language of grade level readiness, because in the best case, this term is used to hold schools accountable to preparing students to be ready for their next level of study. But too often that language is code for excluding rather than including. Exclude students who may have incredible strengths but don't appear to be grade level ready as measured by standardized tests. And any of us who have children know that some walk at a particular age, some talk at a particular age, some can throw a ball or kick a ball at a particular age. But if we stick too closely to prescribed schedules of development, we can exclude rather than include. The six years of school covered by an exam school education are an eternity when it comes to academic development. There is so much possible for students when they're given the opportunity to work with a talented staff over the course of six years. A wide range of student needs can be met, particularly when you're already starting with a team of all-stars. Oops, there goes my ear thing. I encourage the task force members to consider components to a proposal that continue to allow students of all profiles to compete to be the best of their peers. Waiting an exam less like 20% or eliminating it entirely as a requirement will give students and IEPs and English learners a more fair chance. Allowing for students within a particular qualified group to be selected by lottery as opposed to rank order will also be more inclusive. For those who argue something closer to a straight meritocracy or something with ranking, I give you the example from something I'm passionate about, which is baseball. Now, Major League Baseball will soon host their annual all-star game. And they don't pick players merely from the teams with the best record or the teams with the highest budget or the teams that are most popular. Every single one of those 30 teams has at least one player representing them. And while some teams may have as many as four or five all-stars, every single team gets at least one. And every single player is a fantastic player who can impact the result of the game and is important to the composition of the team. They are all all-stars. I encourage you to ensure that the policy you propose on Wednesday allows for a similar representative, a representation of BPS to send their all-stars, all of their all-stars to these exam schools. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Mary Badenfeld. <laughs> <clears throat> Mary Barenfo, please unmute yourself and turn on your video. Uh, 
Here you are. Oh, there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, good evening. Um, I'm Mary Battenfeld. Um, I'm a parent of a resident of Jamaica Plain and a parent of three Boston Public School graduate and a member of Quest Quality Education for Every Student. Um, and I want to first again thank you for all your work. Um, again, though, including those who. Um, who have different opinions in mind, but following up on, on Mr. Pai, I wanted specifically to uh, address uh, Lowell High School and, and the lottery and as a third rail. Um, Lowell High School, um, uh, in having a 100% lottery, boosted its Black students by 150%. The number of Latinx students nearly doubled. Siobhan Hines Foster, who is the head uh, of the Black Student Union at Lowell High School does not find this policy disastrous. The Reverend Amos Brown, a longtime civil rights leader in San Francisco, does not find this policy disastrous. So um, I urge you, if you're thinking about Lowell, to look at the full evidence for what's happened. Um, second, in terms of the lottery, as um, I, uh, Quest, the group I'm part of, was the parent group that really started as an effort to prevent Boston from returning to neighborhood schools. The Boston Globe editorialized um, that um, that a lottery would be disastrous. <laughs> um, that we that instead we should get rid of it and have a you as they put it, as the globe put it uh, you live here you go there neighborhood straight up neighborhood school policy um, many around the city um, uh, fought against that um, we didn't win entirely it is still uh, the, the current student assignment is still problematic but not because it involves a lottery it's problematic because it involves home-based preferences that are based in neighborhood and neighborhood discrepancy so as you um, continue your discussion i really uh, urge you to you know to be open to and to look at evidence um, in addition to being a a longtime BPS parent. I'm also on the faculty at Boston University. Um, I, I, I don't arrive at conclusions without looking at evidence. And I think, you know, as Mr. Pai said, as you've heard over and over again, you know what the evidence is. Um, not having a test and not having a lottery um, results in the most diverse and um, best student body for our schools. And I hope you'll consider to follow the evidence and open your minds to a possibility that we can, as Arundhati Roy said, use the pandemic as a portal to a better system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan and Mr. Santapasi. That concludes our speakers for tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. So um, I would like to, and I appreciate the um, the comments this evening, um, and also again, kind of the the robust um, continue to be robust, rigorous uh, debate among the task force members. Um, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'd like to do something different tonight. Um, rather than adjourn this meeting, I'd like to entertain a motion to suspend this meeting, um, which is a little bit different. Um, that will give us an opportunity to just, again, we are about to make a very significant decision, um, a recommendation that you know has you know almost nearly our entire city. Um, on edge. Uh, and so I, again, rather than adjourning this meeting, I would like to entertain a motion to suspend the meeting, which will give us an opportunity to just think over the next um, few hours before we um, come back together on um, tomorrow. Um, so that is what I, that is the motion I would like to entertain, a motion to suspend. I, so I move. Um, Mr. Kreger, and that's a second from Ms. Lum. Um, that motion requires um, a two thirds vote for passage. Um, the motion to suspend requires a two thirds vote um, for passage. Um, 
So is there any um, discussion on that or can we move to a vote? Seeing none, we're gonna move to a vote. Um, Ms. Parvex, could you call the roll, please? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ms. Lasseveri? Uh, um, in, in truth, I have trouble distinguishing Ms. Sullivan um, adjournment or from suspension, but if it has the effect of ending deliberations tonight and continuing them tomorrow evening, fine. Is that a, we just need I your- I think it is. Uh, or, you can, or you can always abstain if you'd like. I, all right. Um, Recognizing my own ignorance with respect to the nature of the motion, I, I guess I abstain. Ms. Aguirre? Actually, I, I'm also wondering what's the difference. Could you explain before we vote? Sure, that was the purpose of the discussion. So if, there are, if there's unreadiness, I'm happy to, really the distinction is if we adjourn the meeting, we're ending the meeting. Um, with all decisions that have been made intact. If we suspend the meeting, the meeting is continuing, same meeting, continuing tomorrow, which would give us an opportunity, again, understanding, recognizing the weight of the decision which would give us an opportunity to just reflect and make sure that before we close this thing out, put a bow on it, we're okay. Ms. Sullivan, what, would, what effect would that have on the items that um, it would appear that we had decided on? Were, well, would we, yep. can, would we, would we, would they be considered decisions or what would the, the nature of the, that discussion be? Great question. So we didn't take any votes tonight. We, surveyed, there were no votes taken tonight. We surveyed the group to come to some consensus um, with respect to the 70, 30, 100% straight rank allocation within SES tiers. Um, so again, the, the primary impact of suspending versus adjourning would be that suspending just means that we're continuing the same meeting versus an adjournment would mean that we'd be closing out this meeting and opening up a completely new one. And technically being able to reopen tonight's discussion. Correct, it'd be, I mean, it, we wouldn't be closing out the meeting, it's the same meeting. Suspending is continuing this meeting, the same meeting tomorrow. Do you want to start over again or are there more questions? We can start the roll again. Are there more questions on that? Well, I, I just don't want to start the whole discussion from scratch, from scratch tomorrow, you know? I mean, I think that it took us a long time to, to get where we are right now. And honestly, I am not willing to start from scratch tomorrow again, over and over. I understand that. I, I'm not sure, Ms. Sullivan, what, what that would, I would agree with Ms. Aguirre. I, I'm, I am concerned about returning, real, you know, reopening a discussion where, where I, I think we're near consensus. I would be concerned about that. Um, I'm not sure what impact that would, the difference. Would be. So then let's go to a vote. So then let's go to a vote. If if the task force votes down the motion, then so be it. We'll move to adjournment. But again, I did. I, I just in. I'm asking for the motion to. I I requested a motion to suspend. It was moved and properly seconded. The body has an opportunity to vote on it. It requires a two thirds vote to pass. If it doesn't pass, then we'll entertain a different motion. Any other questions? Okay. Wait, could we start at the top, Ms. Parvex? Ms. Parvex, could you start at the top with the roll? 
Yes. Please, thank you. Mr. Acevedo? I abstain. Ms. Aguirre? I abstain. Mr. Chano? Yes. Is that the right? Is that the right thing to say? Yes. <laughs> All right. Mr. Craiger? Yes. Dr. Prima Wisdom? Oh. Uh, Ms. Grassa? Yes. Ms. Lam? Ms. Lam? Yes. Ms. Nagasawa? Yes. Ms. Garrett? The same. Dr. Tang? Yes. Ms. White? Yes. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Contempasse? Yes. Three, um, sorry. Three abstain and one absent. What was the abstention? I only counted two abstentions. Mr. Acevedo, Ms. Aguirre, and Ms. Skerritt. Oh, okay. Thank you. So the motion carries. Thank you. We greatly appreciate that. Um, we'll see the task force members back. What time are we tomorrow? Five o'clock. 5 p.m. We'll see you back here 5 p.m. tomorrow. Thank you. I said thank you at the beginning. So I told you. All right. All right. See you tomorrow. Thanks. Bye.